Now I would like to request Rachita Mishra, Associate Director of Silver Foundation, to come up on the stage and give a brief context about our work in the northeastern region on energy for health. Welcome, Rachita. permission to tell you about our program that we're doing together itself. Uh, but hopefully what this context helps us is that as we start on this two-day workshop to really decide or you know come to some key conclusions around what we have learned and what we need to take forward in the coming year as well, uh, we keep the broader picture in mind of what was that first vision that we set forth and what did we decide to kind of do together in the states of the Northeastern region itself. So to start off, uh, you know, why do we have the eight states sitting here? We know that the context of this region is requires solutions which are meant for the context of the northeastern states itself. We know, for example, that a lot of the terrain is very hard to work in, but it's also a place where there is very rich natural resources. You know, we have we we have areas which are good forested regions which we need to conserve and preserve. In addition to that, we also know that in comparison to other parts of the country, uh, we have actually low density in this region as well, right? So we have population density which is low, we have remoteness which actually makes access to any service pretty hard for a lot of the communities that we actually serve. And the third aspect is that of course with growing climate change, we're all noticing variabilities, not just in terms of temperature, but rainfall hits this region pretty harshly. Not only some of the regions get flooded, but also because it's a hilly terrain, we have landslides, which means that any kind of maintenance of any infrastructure becomes extremely, extremely hard. So when we speak about the energy and health infrastructure as well, of course it gets compounded by these contexts, right? So, but this is not new to us. We know this is a challenge. We know that this is an opportunity to innovate as well. And I would, you know, request everyone to look, look at this as an opportunity to innovate and keep that in mind when we're discussing the next two days. I always have bad luck with technology, so operations and maintenance for me first, please. But yes. Um, now, when we have been looking at our program so far, um, there are three levels of impact that we see immediately, or three levels of impact that at least we are trying to target through the program itself. The first and foremost, uh, we, you know, as we have spoken already in the morning, is the communities that are actually not that actually deserve good basic human, as a, as a basic human right, good services, health services itself. Now over here, one of the things is, you know, we've almost, you know, in the very beginning, we used to always say that, you know, health services might be free, but getting to a health facility costs quite a bit to a lot of our communities. And that's been the first agenda. How do we really get quality health services closer to people? Right? So that, that itself, the barrier of traveling a few kilometers to, a get, to get to a health facility, that itself should not be the reason that someone doesn't, someone dies or someone has huge costs or has health burden overall. The second aspect has also been, which we have heard from many of you in this room, is that our health system is designed in a certain way. We want sub-centers to function in a certain way, primary health centers to deliver certain uh, you know, uh, health services as well. 
But because many a times those are not functioning the way that they should, the burden lies on the district hospitals. The few doctors who are sitting there have queues and queues of patients with basic flu, basic diseases that actually we can cater to from our sub-center and primary health centers. So that's really the above thing, which also is that how do we really distribute the patient load more efficiently, but that actually makes the experience of the community better as well, because their waiting time reduces. So these are some of the impacts that we see at the community level immediately. The second aspect, we have an amazing medical workforce. You know, doctors, nurses, you know, AM workers, administrative staff who are working in these remote health facilities with poor infrastructure. They're trying their hard to make sure that, you know, the missions that we have decided on as, you know, health department or health ministry in the country, they're delivering on that. But how do we really increase their confidence that what they have learned, the skills that they have, they're actually able to deliver those services. And that happens when we say, we are taking care of you. We're giving you a health infrastructure which is functional. It's hygienic, it has the medical equipment, it has basic light, basic fat, mobile charging points, plus of course the equipment that are functioning as well. So that is the second piece of impact that we've often heard of, which happens immediately. That the boost of confidence, the morale increases of a lot of the health facility staff that are working in these remote areas. And they're then able to deliver the services, because in the end, what really determines good health services being determined is not that it's electrified or not, it's actually our staff who's interacting with the patients, patients at the health facility. And the third level, which was more, you know, I kind of pointed towards that as a challenge in the first slide, is that we know that when there is rainfall, when there is summer happening, you know, there are uh, unreliability issues that come up, obviously, in our energy infrastructure itself. Power cuts that come in, um, you know, spaces or facilities that get completely trapped because of landslides, because of flooding. And this means that our first, you know, care providers need to be accessible at that point of time. So because of the energy system that we want to be able to design and deploy in the northeastern region, we hope that it actually results in not just an economically viable and a reliable health infrastructure, but also something which is resilient to a lot of the climate change uh, variabilities that are going to come up and, and um, you know, we're all going to be facing uh, in, in the different parts of the country itself. So as you can imagine, we're saying energy, energy, but our aim has really been to say how do we ensure that there is universal health access to all, but we do it in a manner that we empower it or catalyze it through sustainable energy. And from there, what automatically comes into the picture is also an action towards climate change itself. Right? So that's really been the overall vision and health first approach powered by sustainable energy, which also results in climate adaptation. Now, what are the different aspects of the program? The first aspect, as I mentioned already, is to really look at health first. It's not about powering health facilities because we know the first aspect has to be that the health services reach the people. How those health services are going to be improved, one aspect is going to be through energy, which is why your role in this room ex becomes extremely important. It's your vision on how you want to improve health in your states, and we are here to partner with you to boost and catalyze that with energy itself. Right now, so far in the program, we've looked at these three, the top three boxes that you see as the main priorities, because these are the priorities that we're really trying to extend in the last mile area. Maternal and child healthcare, immunization and diagnostics, primarily for non-communicable diseases, but other services that are being provided as well. In addition to that, what that results in, us getting a better understanding of what medical equipments are there, how do we make them more efficient, how do we make our buildings more efficient, and then talk about powering. Let's reduce the need for energy itself before actually looking at the energy source for it. What I'd also invite all of you to do is outside and tomorrow, outside you'll see some demonstrations of new medical technologies which might be relevant for your states and actually decentralizing health services further. Telediagnostic units, portable vaccine carriers, you know, different lab equipments that might be there that you will find use of in your vision for health in your state itself. The second aspect of the program has been that we all know that it's not just the technology that is going to 
star health system. It's a whole systemic approach that we need to put in place. So while we start by understanding what the health need is and what appliances infrastructure we need, from there on we start actually building the capacity of the health system. Again, something that we look for your partnership on. What does this exactly mean? From our understanding, there are five components to this. First is, of course, technology, which is going to enable a lot of delivery of the health services. But more importantly, after that is also training and skills of our staff, which is going to you know, enable them to use this technology for the right medical service deployment. In addition to that, of course, there are many other things that come into service delivery. We can have, we can diagnose people, but if we don't give them medicines after that, you know, what is the use of it? So there are many different aspects that also come in around supply chains, not just of the medical equipment and the energy aspect itself, but overall of the health system that needs to be accounted for when we are doing these uh, deployments as well. Fourth is nothing can be done without finance. And again, you know, we can come in, we can power all the health facilities, put some amount of money in it today. But if we don't have regular understanding of what would it take to maintain, maintain a system like that, upgrade the system as well, the project is going to remain as a one-time project. But what we all imagine hopefully is like a vision of how to upgrade our health facility infrastructure forever. And that would require that we look at financing and policy in a completely different way as well. So those are the fourth and fifth aspects of the program. Once we have the system established as well, the other key piece of the program has been operations and maintenance. Many of the states that are here have taken huge strides in actually declaring most of their health facilities as running on solar power today. But what we really need to do now is ensure that that is complemented by a system which allows for ownership and operations and maintenance to happen very, very strongly. What has this program resulted in is these are some of the few images that you see from projects across the, across the states in the northeastern region. Of course, the easy thing to imagine is that all of our health facilities are running on solar. But at the same time, what you see here is some innovative projects as well, just to expand your mind slightly. Uh, we don't, and many a times, we might not need a health facility infrastructure itself, a building. We might look at vans that are delivering key diagnostic uh, services to the, to the regions. We might look at immunization being reached by some of our, uh, you know, the last mile health workers who are going door to door. We might even have boat clinics which are running in the islands of Brahmaputra. Right? So the, actually the, the, you know, the, 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 the scope for innovation can go as far as our mind can reach. But those ideas need to come from the ground, the people who are really struggling to deliver these services. The more that we understand that, the more that we can actually expand and really um, you know, help you in, uh, in implement that vision as well. The last piece we wanted to cover was, as, as uh, Thomas had already mentioned, that our, uh, you know, the, when, when we started on this journey, we probably did our first health facility in 2017 or so. Um, COVID was the time when actually many people in this room, um, you know, really kind of collaborated with us and helped us understand our role better. And that's the time when in three of the states, or two of the states particularly in the northeastern region, we completely blanketed five districts, all health facilities being solar powered. That actually pushed us. So many of you in this room actually pushed us to again expand the vision and say, let's look at 25,000 health facilities across the country. <laughs> To give you a sense, all of you would already know this, this is only about 10 to 12 percent of the health facilities in the country. So no way is this enough. But what we really feel is that the more we do, this number is going to help us understand how do we look at need assessments, how do we look at system designs, how do we do procurement, how do we do financial allocations, and what kind of policy changes do we need to implement a program like this at scale. And because of that is where, you know, the, the knowledge that will come from all of you will be incredibly important for us to take this program forward to other states as well together. Uh, the vision, again, 25,000 is, uh, again, across 12 states in the country, but 
you know, the first priority for us is to really look at the eight states in the northeastern region and for that we invite all of you to partner with us. The ones who are not, some of you are already collaborating with us very, very strongly. Uh, but hopefully what we're able to do is first deliver to the people of the northeastern region a very, very resilient healthcare infrastructure which is powered by an energy system which is economically viable. I wouldn't even bring in climate here. It is economically viable for your states to take this decision as many of our partners who have been collaborating will already tell you. And what that automatically results, you know, as our keynote speaker kind of spoke about earlier, is something which is climate resilient as well. It is not only going to make health service delivery possible in the, in the times of disaster, but it would also be something that would not contribute to climate change going forward. So thank you so much and I wish all of us um, a discussion which helps us go forward. Um, really look forward to one-on-one -on -one discussions with all of you as well. Uh, really looking forward to feedback and new ideas on how we can catalyze and innovate further.